the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I'm going to go ahead with uh, the scripture for today, the message. It was toward the end of his earthly ministry that the Apostle Paul gave these words of admonition to the church leadership of his day. Listen closely to what he said. This is the church of the first century. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you. My constant watch and care over you night and day and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all of those he has set apart for himself. May God add a blessing to this reading of his holy word. Amen. This church made a bold and decisive move <coughs> last Wednesday evening to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church and move toward membership with the Global Methodist Church. The vote was in the 96th percentile, which how many know that's a pretty decisive vote? Amen? Amen. Now I thought that what you did needed not only to be announced publicly and celebrated this morning, but I felt that I wanted to bring some context as to what you did and even maybe why you did it. The scripture we just read makes it clear that false teachers have been around since the first century AD. They were at work deceiving people in Paul's day and they are hard at work in our day. They were at work in the circles that the apostles traveled in and they are at work in the circles of modern day Methodism. As pastor of the Church of the Resurrection, Adam Hamilton has the honor of leading the largest United Methodist congregation in the United States, claiming a membership of up to 25,000. The Kansas congregation is considered by many to be America's most influential mainline Protestant church. Hamilton is leading the charge for the post-separation United Methodist Church. His website, called UMC Next, referring to the next kind of Methodism, lays out the four principles that articulate the vision for the next United Methodist Church. And I'd like to spend a few moments talking about what has been happening even since Wednesday night when we took our vote. Here is number one principle on UMC Next website. It says, we long to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ, committed to a Wesleyan vision of Christianity, anchored in scripture and informed by tradition, experience, and reason as we live a life of personal piety and social holiness. Now that all sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds real good. But the caveat here is that this group places as much valuation on the human aspects of tradition, well, maybe less on tradition, but much higher on the reason part, which is the ability to think for oneself, which they're very good at, and also experience, which they also value greatly. Reason and experience, my friend, in Wesley's thinking, never took a backseat to the Scripture. The Scripture was always true, and if your thinking and if your experience contradicted the Scripture, then toss out whatever you're thinking and toss out whatever experience you've had. The Word of God is true. Amen. And that is the place where they break with John Wesley, much as they would like to claim him as their founder. Number two. 
We commit to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in all forms. Now this is almost the exact wording of the current membership vows of the United Methodist Church. But the next part that follows is nowhere near what the membership vows say. It continues, and toward all people and build a church which affirms the full participation of all ages, nations, races, classes, cultures, gender identities, sexual orientations, and abilities. So you can see that the world is influencing and driving the theology of the left. It's what the world says is true is what they're claiming as truth. And the worldly expressions of human sexuality are not only going to be welcome in UMC next, but they are going to be celebrated. Then we come to number three. Number three says we reject the traditional plan that was approved at General Conference 2019 as inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ and we will resist its implementation. Now think about that for a moment. They reject the traditional plan, a plan which, by the way, states that marriage is by biblical definition the union of one man and one woman in a holy matrimony or in a covenant union. This, it says, they will resist implementing, and notice the reason, because they find it inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My goodness, well, it's probably not their fault. They probably just never read this exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees from Matthew 19, verses 3 to 6, where it tells us that some Pharisees came and tried to trap him, meaning Jesus, with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. Notice, just two genders, male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Amen. So notice that in answering this question about divorce, Jesus feels it's necessary to begin by going back to the beginning and laying the groundwork for what the Bible and what he considers a biblical marriage. That being one man with one woman who, upon the agreement of the marriage covenant that is verbally spoken and promised before God and witnesses, called a covenant union, that upon that uh, marriage vow, they are then assuming the roles of husband and wife, and that they are united as one in a covenant union that no one is ever to separate. And yet the Adam Hamilton crowd is resisting the implementation of the traditional plan that affirms this teaching, saying that it is contrary to the gospel. You've got to be kidding. We just heard uh, Jesus say it. So just what Bible is Adam Hamilton reading? That is my question. Or, as Jesus so accused the Pharisees, has he read the scriptures at all. And then number four says this, we will work to eliminate discriminatory language and the restrictions and penalties in the discipline regarding LGBTQ persons. We affirm the sacred worth of LGBTQ persons, celebrate their gifts, and commit to being in ministry together. Now here's the kicker, folks. Adam Hamilton continues to say that those who believe in the traditional view of marriage, why those congregations and those pastors will of course be welcome in UMC next and we will affirm them in their viewpoints. They will never be required to perform same-sex ceremonies if it offends their sensibilities. 
all while maintaining right on his website that they will resist the implementation of traditional views of marriage. I'm sorry, Adam, but you can't have it both ways. Furthermore, you might be interested to know that at last week's Northeast Jurisdictional Conference, where the next bishops of the United Methodist Church were selected, not a single theologically traditional bishop was elected to office, not one. Oh, there were some candidates in the mix, there were traditional candidates to be sure, but it's just that none of them seem to make the cut. No, the next UMC is not waiting until General Conference of 2024 to make their direction known. They are making their intentions known right now. Last week, new bishops were elected to all five jurisdictional <coughs> conferences, which covers the whole country, five jurisdictions. They all elected new bishops. And what makes that historic before we even get to who they elected is that according to the Book of Discipline, which is supposed to be the rule of law for United Methodism, the jurisdictional conferences cannot be held until after a general conference meeting takes place, which was supposed to happen back in May of 2020, but because of the pandemic was postponed. It's interesting to note that other denominations went, and went ahead and had their meetings electronically. They were able to set it up in other countries and get their work done, but not the United Methodist Church. They felt that that was just uh, too difficult, and so they rejected it. And not only that, but the General Conference was also supposed to meet just three months ago at the end of August. But that idea was also overruled by those who had an agenda. It is interesting that in the ruling given by the Judicial Council, and if you're wondering what that is, that is the Supreme Court of the United Methodist Church that makes the final decisions the Judicial Council has been in the back pocket of this Council of Bishops now for the last two years. Absolutely every radical idea the Council of Bishops have had, the Judicial Council has rubber stamped it for them and said, sure, go right ahead. The latest case is that the Supreme Court of the United Methodist Church, known as the Judicial Council, uh, was asked if they could go ahead. Is it, is it fair to go ahead with these elections of bishops, even though there has been no general conference meeting? And they said, this was their reply. They said, well, we have absolutely no authority to give you permission to do this, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. That was how they made their ruling. So the result, as reported by Jay Therrell, the president of the Wesley Covenant Association, who were the, this is the group that formed the Global Methodist Church in answer to this radicalism from the left. Jay Farrell said that we now have the most liberal council of bishops in the history of Methodism. Not just United Methodism, all of Methodism. There has never been such a liberal slate of bishops. Now let's look at a couple of the elected officials. On the first ballot, Kenetha Bigham Tsai was elected. You say, well, who is she? Well, she's on record in her Episcopal interviews when she was meeting with the other bishops to see if she should be elected, and she made this statement. She said, it is not important in the United Methodist Church that we all agree on who Christ is. Not important. I'm sorry, but that is a deal breaker. If we do not agree that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that His death on the cross provided the atonement for sin and makes us heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, then we really have nothing in common at all. It is unacceptable to deny the historic creeds of the faith that define who Jesus is and what He did for us. On this, we must all agree. Then there was the election of Bishop Hector Burgos by the Northeast Jurisdiction. Bishop Burgos was appointed to our conference, the Upper New York Annual Conference, from which we just disaffiliated, or I should say we're in process, 
By the way, I have a nasty cold this morning, so if you were going to give me a holy kiss after the service, I'm going to give it I found it fascinating that those in attendance at the conference when uh, Bishop Burgos was elected, they thought it would be a really nice idea to assign a spirit animal, a spirit animal, to our new bishop. And so the United Methodist News Service reported the following, quote, at a meeting among the Upper New York delegates earlier this year, they discussed the many qualities they would want in an Episcopal leader. Then they pondered what animal would represent all these qualities, and they chose a unicorn. End quote. <laughs> Having read that, I found myself somewhat relieved that they did not choose a humpback camel or a chimpanzee. <laughs> That's just me. Then we also have the new bishop, Dottie Escobedo Frank. Dottie Escobedo Frank, very, very interesting. She comes from the Desert Southwest Conference, and a quote from her website says that she calls on the wisdom of the heretics and the edge dwellers to lead the church forward. Heretics and edge dwellers should be leading the church in her mind. The Western jurisdiction also managed to elect the denomination's second openly gay bishop, Cedric Bridgeforth, is now a United Methodist bishop, and he will be leading the United Methodist Church forward in his conference, along with his husband, Christopher. This is just a brief overview from the WCA President, Jay Farrell, who then added this. He said, as of January 1st, 2023, when all of the new bishops take their places in the various annual conferences where they will be serving, the retirements will have occurred the day before. So a number, I think it's about, uh, I don't know how many, I, I'm not going to try to say, but a number of bishops are retiring on, Ju on uh, December 31st. One of them is our bishop, Bishop Mark Webb, who has been a very strong, evangelical, outspoken bishop, and I'm very thankful he has been my bishop for the last several years. But Bishop Webb will be stepping down, retiring, and Bishop Burgos will take his place. But according to Jay Farrell, he said, as of January 1st, 2023, there will be no traditional bishops left in the United Methodist Church. They will have all been replaced by rabid institutionalists. <coughs> now I can still remember my introduction to the United Methodist Church 30 years ago as I sat in the office of the Binghamton District Superintendent. I remember him explaining to me for the first time an illustration that I would hear over and over again in the years to come, that the United Methodist Church, he said, it's like a big tent. And over on the left side of that tent, we have progressive thinkers and liberal theologians. And, and on the right of that tent, why we have the conservatives and the evangelicals. And in between, there's a mix of a hodgepodge of everything else. Well, I read an article this week that talked about that big tent. And I would like to close my remarks by quoting liberally from that piece, which I thought was very well written. It was written by a pastor, Randy Burbank, from the Southwest Jurisdiction. And here is a portion of what he wrote. The recent Southeastern Jurisdictional Conference, or I should say the results of that meeting, reveals that there really is no room in the United Methodist Church for traditionalists. At that event, three out of three newly elected bishops are in favor of changing our book of discipline to redefine what is considered Christian marriage. If that wasn't enough proof for anyone that this alleged big tent, if it ever really existed, is getting smaller and smaller for traditionalists, then you need to look at the three resolutions that were passed. 
One was called leading with integrity. Leading with integrity. And it calls for all persons who intend to leave the United Methodist Church to immediately remove themselves from any positions they hold within the United Methodist Church and refrain from any participation in our processes. I was taught, says the author, and always believed, that you are what you are until you ain't. Centrists and progressives want traditionalists out, even while they're still in the United Methodist Church. And if these centrists and progressives want to talk about integrity, then why don't they call out those who have no integrity, those who are in open violation of our book of discipline, not to mention the Bible itself. Sometimes they believe that their sin is not as bad as your sin. And the tent got smaller. Then there's that resolution by the queer delegates. The author says, don't shame me. That's how they identify themselves. Their resolution, which was called, quote, queer delegates call to center justice and empowerment for LGBTQIA plus people in the United Methodist Church. That's the title of their resolution. Amended from its original presentation, it calls for the United Methodist Church to remove the biblical standard from our discipline. Get that scripture out of there. Come on. In other words, they wanted the UMC to declare that homosexuality is no longer a sin if it ever was a sin. And remember... That resolution passed. And the tent keeps getting smaller. And then came the third resolution. A resolution in support of a United States regional conference. Watch this one. This resolution wants to form a way for the United States to have its own set of values and believe what it wants while the rest of the world is free to believe something different. And as ludicrous as that sounds, it passed. Now tell me, how can one part of the church believe one thing and another part of the church believe the exact opposite and call themselves a united church? The author says, I think this alleged tent has collapsed. I want to leave you with one other thought. He says, according to Paragraph 2553, 33.1% of a local congregation can hold the other 66.9% of the congregation captive to the United Methodist Church. Centrists and progressives want us to remain UMC by the illusion of the big tent. But come 2024, that tent will vanish like David Copperfield's elephant. Think about that, he says, if you still believe there's room for traditionalists in the United Methodist Church. Pastor Randy Burbank. Well, my friends, we have come full circle back to the same heretical positions that were on display in Paul's day. And listen again to his words in verse number 30. He said, even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. My friends, we are at the dawning of a new day. And by the grace and wisdom of God, this church recognized what was happening at the hands of those who were distorting the truth. And you have made a great choice to be done with progressive Christianity, which I promise you is no Christianity at all. It is simply idolatry and the worship of self over the worship of God. I do not want to be in the shoes of these progressives on the day when they stand before the Lord. 
But I will ask that God will help me to be faithful to the truth of his word until the day when I myself must stand before him to answer for my own life and ministry. And you will too. And may God help us to be found faithful on that day, held together by his grace alone. But my friends, you have made a decision to stand with the Global Methodist Church, whose mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, who worship passionately, who love extravagantly, and who witness boldly. We need to uh, get that mission statement up and get people familiar with it. You have joined yourself to a group of people who love the Savior, who refuse to be distracted with arguments about human sexuality, which has hamstrung the United Methodist Church since its very inception. Instead, this church will focus on winning souls to Jesus Christ, finding ways to do creative ministry that will reach the lost, and we will no longer be saddled with the financial restraints and overhead of an institution that is top-heavy with administrative offices. But in its place will be a much lighter and much more streamlined organization who will have no interest in your buildings or your assets and will not seek to own them, but rather will be ready to serve you and to train you and help the local church in its mission of introducing people to Jesus and helping God's people to live out their calling to ministry. My friend, it's a new day dawning, and I am honored to be taking these first steps with you. May God help the Kendrick Methodist Church. Amen. Would you bow with me for prayer? Now, Father, my heart truly grieves. I truly grieve over a lost church. I think of that amazing illustration that you shared about the woman who, in the ancient times, they would have a headband that they wore, the women did, and on their wedding day, they would wear this beautiful headband, and there would be all kinds of coins placed in the folds of that headband. It was something they cherished always, and this one woman pulled out her headband one day, perhaps remembering her wedding day and reminiscing, and she discovered one of the coins was missing, a valuable coin. And the scripture says that she searched all over the house. She searched and searched and swept and cleaned and moved things around, and finally she located that missing coin. She called to all of her friends, and she said, my friends, come, come and celebrate with me. My lost coin has been found. And Father, you are telling us that it's possible to be in the house and be lost in the house. It is possible to be inside of a church but still lost to the gospel message and never understanding where the real treasure is. It is not in the institution. It is not in the pews. It is not in the stained glass windows. It is not in the hymns we sing. It is not in the building or the roof over us or the basement underneath us. The real treasure of the church is the one who founded it and made it beautiful, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the heart of the church. He is the treasure of the church. He is the pearl of great price. And so, Father, I pray for a lost church this day. They are seeking after human secularism. They are seeking after human wisdom. They have be, it has become the cage of every foul and unclean bird. And my heart is truly breaking over the direction that the United Methodist Church is moving in this hour. But I pray for this, that church. I pray that you will turn those people back around. Show them the hypocrisy. Show them that those who are leading them are not leading them to life. They are leading them to destruction. And I pray, Father, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and rescue the United Methodist Church, which I pledged 30 years ago when I became a pastor to call it back to the gospel. I pray, Lord, that you will 
do something to deliver souls who right now are on a path to destruction. But I rejoice and I celebrate with my brothers and sisters here who have made a strong and a bold stand for Jesus Christ, for the gospel. They have recognized the real treasure in their faith. And they have said, I will not be part and party to a group who is going to take the scriptures and toss them into the dustbin. I will not do it. And so, Father, may your blessing continue upon the Kenry Methodist Church. May you continue to lead us forward in the days ahead. And may you continue to give us great wisdom in this separating process. And help us, Father, to do all that pleases you. For we commit ourselves to your way. In Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing this beautiful hymn with me. I love this hymn. The Church's One Foundation. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>